Welcome to Space Security Challenge 2020, Hackasat, the final event. As the democratization of space opens up a new frontier for exploration and innovation, we see new cybersecurity vulnerabilities emerging. The Space Security Challenge is designed to inspire the world's top cybersecurity talent to develop the skills necessary to secure this last frontier of cybersecurity, space. And already we've made a ton of progress. I'll catch you up. This spring, we hosted over 2,000 teams who worked their way through a set of foundational space cybersecurity challenges in our Hackasat qualification round. Now, eight finalist teams are stepping up to the ultimate challenge. They are hacking a satellite. Welcome to the Saturday Daily Recap of Space Security Challenge 2020, or Hackasite. Hackasat. For the second to last time, I'm your host, Jordan Wines, and it's time to fill you in on how our competitors did on day two of this first-of-its-kind satellite hacking competition. Okay, let's get right to the moment everyone's been waiting for. Here is our video to show which team was selected for the on-orbit challenge. Uh, oh, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Actually, it, it, uh, it appears that we're experiencing some tef technical difficulties. Um, yeah, I guess that means you're going to have to listen to the rest of this update, uh, and then we'll play the big reveal at the end instead. So let's take a look back at today's action. In fact, let's go ahead and take a look at the scoreboard now in our live Octagon feed. And they definitely haven't slowed down. You'll notice that Solarwine actually scored first blood on challenge three. Congratulations to them for the great work overnight. You can also see Flux Repeat Rocket scoring just before this broadcast with only a 5% reduction in total points. That means SolarWine and Flux Repeat Rocket are both moving on to Challenge 4. While the score hasn't changed, we have had one important game milestone pass us by. We timed out on available points for Challenge 3. That means those two teams, SolarWine and Flux Repeat Rocket, they have obtained points for that challenge and all other teams were given a solution script so they can focus on the next challenge. If you've been following along at home, you know that we sprung our on-orbit challenge on our teams yesterday. We had four teams submit their solutions by 4 p.m. Pacific, our deadline for evaluation for on-orbit, but only one was selected to have their code sent to the live satellite to capture a moonshot. We will learn who that lucky team is later on in the broadcast. While today's action started strong with several early scores, teams really struggled their way through challenge four today. While the organizers knew it would be the hardest challenge, the hope was that it would be solved before this point. In fact, in the last hour of the competitions, some team had run so low on, on power that the organizers offered to take the flat sats offline so they could plug them into power. This would, means, this would mean teams would, be, would have challenges in solving challenge five, but hopefully it would give them enough power and time to solve challenge four in the last few minutes. Uh, given that, here is, the, here is our ex explanation for the challenge four solution. Challenge four. Here's what we know. We've restored communication with the payload module, but we still can't operate it. The challenge? Now teams must restore normal operations of the payload module so we can access the imager. Here's how they do it. Teams discover that the payload module bootloader has been corrupted, which is why the payload module is not operating normally. The teams discover a system console to the payload module and the ability to access the payload module system console by controlling an undocumented GPIO and multiplexer on the CNDH board. The teams must write a custom flight software application that can control the GPIO and enable access to the payload system console. After writing the application, the teams must upload it to the CNDH and execute it. Once the teams have access to the system console, they will identify that it has been corrupted. The teams will need to research nominal Cubo's bootloader configuration and repair the payload module's bootloader to resume proper operation of the payload module. As I mentioned during your previous update, there was always a chance that the scoreboard was going to go dark. And sure enough, with 30 minutes left in the competition, as teams were hopefully nearing in on a Challenge 4 solution, the organizers decided to keep us all in suspense. Here's a look at our final scoreboard that everyone saw before it went dark. As we can tell, we had a couple of solves later on, but early was where most of the action happened. 
However, with our accepted and rejected on orbit status, we knew that there was two teams who would not be eligible for final prizes. We will make the final actual scores available tomorrow during the closing ceremony. Before you make your predictions on our podium winners, let's take a look at the final challenge five to see what it was teams would have had to solve after they finished challenge four. Challenge five. Here's what we know. We've done our best work and it seems that we've regained control of the satellite. But how do we know for sure? The challenge? Teams must prove that we are fully in control of the satellite system by successfully imaging the moon. I thought I could have solved some of these challenges, and the answer was almost certainly not. I've got a lot of respect for the teams out there who made progress at all through this event, with a very difficult environment, very different to what many other CTFs have to do. There's a lot of extra constraints you have to worry about. For more information on that, let's do one last Q&A session with Jason Latimer to talk about how teams were approaching Challenge 4. Uh, let's see if we can get him in here. Jason, are, are, do you hear me? Yeah, I got you. Excellent, and I hear you as well. Uh, great. Uh, so uh, <laughs> we're wrapped up. The game is over. Uh, I know from I, I, I hopped into a couple of your calls, and I was, was listening to you guys describe some of the, the approaches teams were taking on Challenge 4. Uh, and I thought there's some really, really interesting things that came out of that. I'd love to hear a little bit more from, from your perspective. Yeah, so the background on Challenge 4 was that, you know, the teams had gotten past the implant that the adversary had put on the satellite and that they were trying to use the payload and quickly found that the payload wasn't functional. Um, so what the adversary had done was uh, corrupted the, the bootloader. And so they had to, you know, uncorrupt the bootloader. Uh, there were a number of approaches. Um, teams seemed to be struggling in the beginning. So at one point we gave a hint that said, hey, you need to write an, an application that's capable of, of communicating with the system console and enabling that system console via GPIO. Uh, very quickly, a team started uploading their custom CFS applications. Uh, some teams uh, were just trying to enable uh, the GPIO to control the system console based on other GPIOs that were already on the system. And they had done that successfully. And then uh, we had some unique uh, approaches where teams were trying to upload uh, applications that could do uh, like TFTP transfers to the device. So we had a number of different app approaches. Yeah, I was, was going to say, so the, the, the application that they're compiling, was this like a, just a standard compiler they could use or what sort, of, uh, what sort of information about that environment that they have to have to build these custom applications? Yeah, so it's it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. And we, we didn't want that to be the challenge behind the whole, you know, restoring the bootloader. So we actually did provide to the teams ahead of time the RTEMS build environment they would need to, to build an application. And then we provided also uh, in, a set of example applications that they could use as a template for creating this, this uh, application that would restore the bootloader on the payload. Um, there was still quite a bit of challenges there because there were specific peripherals that they'd have to be able to control. So... Um, talking to, you know, uh, specific uh, UART and uh, GPIO drivers to do that. So it was non-trivial. Yeah, what did, what did your solution look like? I mean, it just sort of like, did it rebuild it? Or how did, how did your intended solution work on that? Yeah. So we had a custom application that ran in CFS uh, that could talk to the Raspberry Pi uh, system console over the UART. So it was literally like talking to this, you know, system console. We would send a command and we could... You know, do an LS on the shell or whatever it was, and and through that we could uh, we could uh, restore the bootloader via just typical system console commands. Uh, but in order to actually enable that UART, we had uh, a GPIO that was hidden. So uh, one of the challenges uh, for Challenge Four was actually looking through the FPGA uh, Verilog and VHDL code and finding that that actually existed. So we had gotten some feedback during quals that you know teams were really interested in doing that kind of documentation reverse engineering. So we, we we went to a lot of effort to make sure that that existed. So to even identify that that was there, they were doing code inspections of the VHDL and the, and the Verilog for the FPGA. Now, I, I heard hints that like at least one team was doing something creative with like direct memory uh, writes. What, 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 what do we know about that? Uh, all we know about that, well, uh, Teams were doing uploads of applications, but it, it looked like uh, some teams were using the direct memory writes to actually uh, interact with that shell, the, the Raspberry Pi shell. So a little different than our approach, um, but yeah, it was interesting. 
if it gets if it gets your code running and gets it working right there's there's no yep, points yep. for uh for the jankiness or the cleverness it's just does it solve the challenge right so one of the things yep. that, that i just mentioned to people of course was the uh, the power constraints and how m many of the satellites were running low on power at the end from a lot of movement throughout the day and a lot of usage uh, and the sort of option they had to, to get connected to a ground power. Uh, tell me how that changed the sort of Challenge 5 requirements. And if a team was able to solve a Challenge 4 after the scoreboard went dark, um, would they have been able to do it uh, from the ground or was that completely impossible or, or what happened there? Yeah, so we talked with the organizers and, and based on the fact that we had these power constraints, um, and that the teams that had elected to be put on the ground wouldn't be able to get a picture of the moon. Uh, we adjusted the criteria for challenge five to just be get a picture. It was interesting to see what the different, um, it was interesting to see what the different teams were doing as far as power. Um, some teams had conserved their power throughout the day and other teams had not. So we had some teams that were in the running to solve challenge four. Uh, you know, that said, hey, we don't want to be put on the ground. We'll just stay on the carousel. We've, we've, we've been good with the batteries all day. And, and we actually mentioned that in an earlier update here, that, that power was, was potentially a concern. And it, it was nice that teams weren't entirely out of the running, right? There was sort of a backup mechanism, but it cost them time while, the, while the, their, their flat set was taken down, was rewired in. And so yep. that was sort of a penalty for exercising that option, although they weren't kind of out of the running entirely. That, that, that works out great. All right. Well, thank yep. you very much for taking time to, to, to talk to us. And uh, we'll continue on with the rest of our update. Thank you. All right, now the moment that you hopefully have actually been waiting for. Uh, we're gonna answer the question as to which team had their code sent into space tonight. So the, the video that we're gonna look at here is the same one that I, that I previewed earlier. So we can see Poland can is the very first team to get an acceptable payload. We knew that from watching the scoreboard and got reasonably close. Uh, next coming in are going to be several other teams, ADD Vulcan number two, and then number three, uh, Flux Repeat Rocket. So we've got the three quickest ones, and then we're going to have right here a Samurai come in. So these were the four that came in before the timeline. So if we stop right now, this is our launch cutoff, right? So these were the teams uh, that came in, and if we look at closest to the bullseye, you can see that Poland Candida Space just beat out Flux Repeat Rocket with the most accurate solution during our window and this is the payload that's being run on an actual satellite right now so we're looking forward to getting the results back from that uh, tonight as uh, it runs and then tomorrow during the live event we're going to show you hopefully the moonshot we'll find out how how accurate it was uh, and of course we're going to continue the run here because we, as i mentioned earlier uh, we know there was that sort of like sudden death uh, for the last two slots right and we could see the teams that were uh, two more slots that were available, and so after that 7 p.m. cutoff, we had a quick 1553 uh, that was able to make it in, but also noticed that Poland Can really got in close, and so they got a really, really nice solution. They kept iterating on it. There was no points for it. There was no extra, um, it was not considered for the on-orbit, um, but it was so good that the, the individuals we had evaluating all of the, the solutions, um, they had a lot of automation, but there was also, I guess, an, a little bit of an art to it. They were explaining that they thought that final, final Poland Can was so beautiful that it was like a piece of art. They loved uh, that, that final solution. Uh, and then of course, uh, we had our last solve here coming in that's gonna be from uh, PFS, which we've already revealed. They were the last team to make it into the, the qualifying minimal acceptable range, which unfortunately left our two other teams, uh, which were uh, SolarWine and 1064 Seabred, uh, not in the running for that. So. First of all, congrats to Team Poland Can Into Space for submitting uh, not only the best solution overall throughout the whole uh, evaluation period, but the solution that is going to space. Uh, let's, let's see their team bio again. into space, I can confirm that your commands were uplinked to our comms in our comms window earlier today. We expect the moonshot to happen in a couple of hours at 6.30 Pacific, and that pic picture will be sent down to Earth at about 1 a.m. Pacific. We will reveal what is hopefully a clear moonshot picture at tomorrow's closing ceremonies. It all depends on how accurate your command really was. Fingers crossed. 
You'd think that just watching instead of playing would be less stressful, and I'm sure it was worse for our competitors. But even in the production room, we were cheering and sweating along with our teams as they worked their way through these challenges. Thanks very much for joining us throughout this event. That's it for today's recap. Make sure you tune in to Hackensack Closing Ceremonies tomorrow at 11 Pacific, where we will hopefully reveal the world's first CTF moonshot taken by Poland Canyon to space. We'll also show you the overall contest results and award the prizes to our teams uh, and reveal what happened after the scoreboard went dark. We'll also hear closing remarks by Dr. Will Roper from the U.S. Space Force and Air Force Acquisition Chief. Be sure to also check out all the great happenings going on at DEFCON and in the Aerospace Village. See you tomorrow at 11 Pacific for the closing ceremonies.